Hello, and welcome to Reimagining Love. I'm Dr. Alexandra Solomon. I have been studying relationships for over 20 years as a couples therapist, a professor, an award-winning author, and as a wife, mother, daughter, sister, and friend. Now, I'm inviting you into this space each week as I dig into some of the toughest and most fascinating relational dilemmas of our time. If you want to discover how to create vibrant and loving relationships in your own life, you have come to the right place. This is Reimagining Love. Welcome back to Reimagining Love. I'm so excited to introduce you to Tara Schuster, my guest on today's episode. This was a really special conversation, and I really think it's going to land deeply for you, no matter what stage you are in of your personal healing journey. So first of all, a little background on the amazing Tara Schuster. She is an accomplished entertainment executive turned mental health advocate and best-selling author of the new and highly anticipated book, Glow in the Effing Dark, Simple Practices to Heal Your Soul, from someone who learned the hard way. It is a relatable and easy to follow guide to help you tend to your deepest wounds, get off what she calls your good enough plateau, and create the spectacular life that you most desire. In February 2020, Tara released her first book, which was titled Buy Yourself the Effing Lilies and Other Rituals to Fix Your Life from Someone Who Has Been There, which was a runaway hit. Previously, Tara served as Vice President of Talent and Development at Comedy Central where she was the executive in charge of critically acclaimed shows like Key and Peel and At Midnight. My conversation with Tara spans so many topics from dating to self-care to family of origin challenges to meditation. But at the heart of it all is a calling that Tara describes so beautifully in our conversation. And that's the project of building a safe home within yourself. This project not only positively impacts every other area of your life, but also everyone else in your life. And that's really what Tara's work and writing is all about. I hope that you love this conversation and hearing from Tara. Hi, Tara. Hi, Alexandra. Thank you for having me. I'm so glad to meet you. Yeah, me too. So I am excited to dive in and break down your brand new book, which is your second book, Glow in the fucking dark. Yes. (laughs) But before we do that, I would love to ask you the relational self-awareness question. Are you ready for it? I am so ready. What is a growing edge that you are currently working on in one of your important relationships? And what has it been teaching you lately? So I am dating again for, I took a year off of dating and I'm actually working with a matchmaker, which is a whole other can of worms. And the thing, it's not just about one particular individual. It's that I don't often say how I actually feel. Like if something's bothering me, if something, if I'd like something to be a different way, I usually just say what I think the other person wants me to say. And so the edge here is like having the confidence to say something. Like I said something last night, or it was on a date, didn't like something and found the words in a kind way to say what I actually meant. And it's so weird because in my book, I'm so honest. Like it's it's this weird, like um, paradox that I can be so honest when I'm writing and when I'm in relation to somebody else, it sometimes is hard for me. First of all, thank you for sharing that because I think that that is a growing edge that is shared by many, many, many people. And this, like this really subtle distinction you're making between who you are in your writing and who you are in dialogue, it's really powerful. And I imagine that also like people are, you know, as they hear you say that they're going to be kind of thinking about their own rifts, you know, like in this one context, I'm like this and this other context, I'm like this. And it's such a reminder. And I think it's one of the risks of the self-help movement is that we can get so interior, you know, so reflective. And that is essential, a thousand percent essential. And 
it is in conjunction with like, okay, now I'm going to, you know, I did some reps on my own and now I'm going to take it, you know, take it to the streets and kind of put it in practice in this different way. Yeah. My therapist says I have to do it in vivo. Like anyone, of, that's right. like, mm-hmm. which always makes me laugh. I'm like, that's a ridiculous word. But if I could add one thing to both books, it would be like, well, obviously you have to practice this. <laughs> like you, you can't just be with yourself. I think it takes a pause, a reflection, a healing, and then going out into the world. Um, and practicing it, though it's not linear like that, obviously, you could be learning it. Like people say, like, do I need to stop, you know, living to heal? And like, sometimes I actually think maybe you need a moment. And that's, that's real and take that moment. And you can't be on the sidelines forever, you know, working alone. Um, It just doesn't work like that. No, that's right. They're the inhale and the exhale. And they're both essential, right? Like we don't, we, we like intimacy with somebody else is completely predicated on our own intimacy with ourselves. So they both like they stand and and books, tools like your book and tools like therapy are essential. And they, I love that they are part of a larger journey, right? Any podcast, any book, any therapy session becomes part of this larger journey that is always in the service of healing the self, but healing the self in relationship to the people who matter. One thing I'm trying to like scream from the rooftops is self-care is always community care if you are doing it in relation. Meaning if as long as you don't go to an island to just be alone forever, if you are a part of your community, your healing matters for that community. Like you are It'd be like we can't have something that's like completely fragile and a mess, you know that 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 affects everybody. So when people get hung up on is self care self indulgent, you know, only if you're thinking about it as just for you, like only if you only if you think you like are the only thing that matters and you're going away and you're not going to share any of your go- your soul or your <laughs> gifts, then yeah, that's pretty self indulgent. But if it allows you to show up in a healthier, more vibrant way, why is that anything other than a miracle for all of us, you know? Well, that's one of my favorite parts of your book is your book really truly is a conversation with me, the reader, with every other person who's going to hold this book in your hands. It is truly a conversation. Like you're like, okay, I'm sharing my healing story with you because I need you healing with me. I need you to remind me when I forget. I want to remind you when you forget. That comes through so clearly in your book. I'm so glad. Okay. So in dating, right. What you know for sure as you step back into dating after having taken some time to catch your breath, to pause, to integrate, to heal, what you know for sure is that your practice is going to be noticing what's happening inside of you, noticing when something doesn't feel quite right and languaging it, knowing full well that speaking what is true and necessary for you is not cruel. In fact, it's the only possible way that somebody can know you and learn how to connect with you. Well, that is actually intimacy. As you bring up, you know, for example, me disclosing something on Instagram that's going on in my life to my um, community is not really intimacy because there's really like, it's not a one-to-one relationship. There's not a lot of stakes involved me disclosing to one person that I'm interested in and that I'm figuring it out. That's so scary. And and to say something that might be displeasing to them. So I am learning, like, basically, I have a little script in my head about how I say things now, so that I'm not searching for the words, like in that moment, you, you prep, you do all, all this self care, all these exercises, it's all like, prep and practice for your life so that in the moment you're not like, oh, I'm so depressed. What do I do? Like, that's a terrible time to make your plan for depression. You know, that's right. Do we get to hear a little bit about what your script is? Yes, for sure. Um, So I actually, I heard about something called authentic relating and um, they were teaching me some of their tools. And one thing really stuck out to me, which was, humility, dignity, humility. So I start like, 
hey, Alexandra, there's something coming up for me right now. Um, would you mind if I shared it with you? You know, so I'm giving you the chance, like yes or no, come with me on on this. The dignity of my own issue, maybe I would say, trying to think of something recent, like I'm really nervous that you're going to reject me or think less of me because I've written a book that really lays out so many problems. And I'm also afraid you won't like me because I was public about all that. So that's, I give dignity to the thing. And then I say something like, so I'm just curious, does, how does that land with you? Do you have any thoughts? And then pause. So an answer might rise, you know, as opposed to like, and like, talk, 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 talk. <laughs> just pause and wait. So that's the phrase I have in my head that I mostly stumble through, but at least I know I, there's a structure because this is all practice for me saying how I really feel. And the structure helps humility, dignity, humility. Yeah. It's um, by Ryle. I don't remember his last name, but if you just Google authentic relating, I found that to be very helpful. It's a really gentle invitation to get to know somebody at a deeper level, right? Because then what I imagine somebody might share with you back to you is, you know, sometimes I worry that in my, as I get to know you, you might feel like I haven't gone deep enough or I'm not profound enough, you know, so it would, it, it invites, right? That just this idea that I think is a Brene Brown idea that courage is contagious. Vulnerability is contagious. And so, you know, as you name this piece that feels present and a little bit messy, a little tender, as you name that, you invite somebody to say, well, actually, I have had some thoughts about what it's like to be sitting across the table from somebody who, you know, has become a mental health advocate and who has written about her soul and her journey in this way. And here's some of what it means to me. And here's some of what I've been thinking about in terms of this. Absolutely. And that is building a real relationship. That is honesty. That's like actual honesty. And I just didn't know that for a long time. I just didn't understand that it was in admitting what was already real, like, because I have those feelings. So those feelings are real. So rather than pretend, let them weirdly dictate my behavior in other ways, because they always come out, like, maybe then I get coy and I get shy and I don't want to talk about myself and I don't want to answer any questions. That's how I cope with that feeling. So how about I don't cope my way through this? How about I just say it? <laughs> you know? Yeah, because it's there and it's not going anywhere and it is part of you. Um, I would love for you to give us a little bit of a sense of your journey, which I know is a big, it's a big question, but you, you know, your career started at Comedy Central and a thriving executive working on these amazing shows. And your career has evolved into becoming an author of these successful books. And I would love for you just to give us a little bit of a sense of your of your journey. And especially, I really want to hear about sort of your like round one of therapy that you wrote about in your first book and how that led into round two of this deeper healing that you have been working on. So, so start where you want. That's where I would love for us to kind of go. Well, I will start with the beginning because I think it gives the context as to why I am doing any of this, um, which is I grew up in a neglectful, psychologically abusive house where things came to die. The pets, you know, all the pets, all the plants, um, the flowers that came free with purchase of the house, nothing could survive. Um, and not because the house was under a mystery hex, but because my parents were just completely neglectful. And so, you know, the coping mechanism I used at that time was getting ahead at school because I wanted teachers and adults to like me and to spend time with me. So very early on, like external achievement was like my lifeline. That, that was what I depended on. So I did really well in school, you know, got myself to Ivy League school, you know, got myself on um, the trajectory towards being a really young executive at Comedy Central. And all that neglect and psychological abuse left its mark. So inside, I was in a constant state of implosion. You know, in high school, I became addicted to weed as a way just to dissociate. Like, I can't handle my feelings. So goodbye. Yeah. You know, when I was working at Comedy Central in the beginning, 
I would just go to the personal call room, you know, where you, you take a moment and just sob. My coping mechanisms in those days were weed, again, booze, boys, distraction, distraction, and actually being such a self-critic that I couldn't hear anything else. It was just a din of, you're ugly, nobody loves you, you're worthless, you're worthless. That's what I came to believe about myself from my childhood, that I was worthless. And it might have kept going this way, you know, good at work, but bad at life. Had I not um, drunk dialed my therapist on my 25th birthday, threatening to kill myself. And she took the threat so seriously that she tried to find me. And that next morning, you know, I felt, I felt um, so ashamed. I felt like, uh, obviously, this isn't good. And if I don't save my life, nobody else will, you know, this isn't, nobody is coming to my rescue. So all these things might have been done to me, but now they're my responsibility. And I worked for five years on quote unquote, reparenting myself, which, which was not a thing, by the way, like I, I wish it had been because it would have given me a lot of shortcuts, but 10 years ago, nobody was talking about reparenting yourself. Um, and I did it for five years, taking notes in a Google document because I'm such a good student. I saw that, a curriculum. You made yourself a little yeah, curriculum. Yeah, uh-huh. curriculum, a curriculum of self-care slash reparenting myself. And by the end of five years, I felt like a different person. I was stable, which was, I'd never tasted stability. I, I had no idea what that was like. And it was at that point when I decided um, I have an offering. You know, I actually did take all these notes. So, and if it happened to me, it must happen to other people and maybe people who didn't have it as bad as I did. And maybe people who had it far worse, that there was a spectrum and that hopefully I could help on that spectrum. And so that's why, you know, my job was, I was an executive at Comedy Central at that time. I was nowhere near like self-help memoir. No. <laughs> that, like, that was You're not comedy. Yeah. yeah. I was in straight up TV comedy um, and doing quite well in that world. And I could see a whole other career path. And then the book came out and so many people related to it and would tell me, wow, it's like you're in my brain. How did you do that? And I realized, oh man, we're all suffering. (laughs) We are all so connected. Um, Like it had brought me stability in that I had spent so much of my life reacting to trauma, you know, like playing whack-a-mole with all these different issues. So it's stable. And now I wondered, could I go deeper and find out who I was before all the bullshit? Like, who was I born to be? And I figured that if people had related to the topic of my first book, then other people must wonder the same question I do, which is, you know, what is my internal voice? Who was I born to be? Can I find a way to feel good enough? You know, and that one I would circle, highlight, and star because I think there are a lot of us who just don't feel good enough at a, at a, you know, base level. So that's that's the journey that I've been on. It's gone from really highly structured routines in "Buy Yourself the Fucking Lilies" to gain, like as we were talking about at the beginning, to gain structure, and now "Glow in the Fucking Dark" is how do you find your shine? How, how do you find how you glow, how you project, like, and how you protect yourself in a world where you have no control? Can you build internal safety? And my answer to that is an emphatic yes, though it seems pretty impossible. Um, so finding internal safety, finding yourself at home in yourself, that's what the topic of glow in the fucking dark is. Yeah. What you have really generously offered the world is your journey, like yourself as a case study. And I love that you couldn't have written Glow in the Fucking Dark until you had written by yourself the lilies, right? Like the structure, like you needed to work through addiction 
in that way by creating structure. Like that was your fate. And, it, and it, I don't know that it goes this way for everybody, but for you, the structure, the ritual, which, which is something you did not experience or know in your family of origin at all, the kind of order and ritual and, and predictability. So you needed to create that for yourself first. You're 100% right. I could never have done the work of glow in the dark had I not done the work of buy yourself the fucking lilies because you can't like self actualize if you are so stuck in I mean suicidal ideation uh, you know constant inner critic like there, there's just no way to transcend until you deal with those base levels and once I got healthy enough that, you know, that's the big thing. Once I had done that work to bring myself stability, I had solid ground to stand on. And now I could fly, you know, now I could like, see what else was out there without being out of my mind scared. You could move out of survival mode. Exactly. Exactly. There's a part that you write in the new book that as an adult, your friends would marvel at the fact that you would take these 20 mile hikes through slot canyons and you would do these solo travel expeditions and your friends called you brave. And you write, quote, I'm not brave. I'm oblivious. I think I just learned to disregard safety altogether. This doesn't mean I don't feel scared all the time. It means I've learned that that's how life is and there's nothing you can do about it. I never tried to fix it because I wasn't aware that the feeling of safety was important. That was really powerful that you you had such an absence of safety that you didn't really even know. You, you can't know how unsafe you were for so long until you began to have little moments of safety. Yeah. yeah. Tell us about that journey. So I grew up in a house where, you know, there were constant threats that um, my mom was constantly telling me that, you know, rapists and murderers are going to kidnap me and take me away. I mean, and, and when I say constant, I mean daily from when I can first remember my dad telling us that we were in financial dire straits um, and like the car being repossessed, the house foreclosed on, just such um, chaos. And then the house itself was an open construction site for five years where the roof, like the ceilings had giant holes in them. The walls, you know, the plywood and insulation was out. I never, ever even considered for one second that you shouldn't be scared all the time. And so, uh, right, a hike by yourself, just that, that was neurophysiologically exactly what felt normal, right? Like aligned with what your body was used to all the time. Exactly. And when I write about slot canyons, I actually, I was on a solo trip um, in Escalante staircase and went down this long, long road called hole in the rock, which is like the most desolate place ever. And I got to this slot Canyon hike. Nobody's anywhere. And I'm like, I'm going to do this. And I don't have service to tell anyone I'm going to do this, but I probably will be okay. Right. And as I go on the hike, I'm going more and more anxious to 10 out of 10 I'm so scared. I'm so scared. I'm like freaking out when I realized, why am I doing this? This hike, what does it matter? Well, there's something wrong if I'm feeling this level terrible about something I that should just be enjoyable. That was a big revelation. And then in the book, I write about overhearing a dad tell his kids that they would be safe when I was at Zion, just overheard this and was like mind blown. Oh, parents provide safety. And it's got it's so different for me now. But I think there are a lot of us who don't understand that it is not normal for your nervous system to be at 10 out of 10. There's a fire constantly, or even more than just a couple times, like, yeah. there's a different way to live. There was a little part of you, right, that started to notice that, like, when you were on the hike and you said, wait a minute, it doesn't have to be this way. Like, that was, what part of you was that, that was saying, maybe there's a different way to do this. Maybe I don't have to feel like this. You know, I think I was gifted a soul that wants to be healthy. The, the best thing I got was just, there's a teeny piece of me that searches for health and wants others to be healthy. 
And I've gotten a lot better at listening to that voice. And for sure, it was this little, hey, man, (laughs) you know, why are we doing this? I'd like you to exit the trail. And so actually, I just went around. I was like, I'm not finishing this. And I love to finish things because I want the stats in my hiking (laughs) app. But I was like, oh, my mental and physical safety is way more important than like, my app giving me a badge. (laughs) (laughs) That's the little, that's, that's the part of you that has always been there for you that I believe is present in all of us. Like that whisper, right. Of wanting rest and peace, like that piece of home inside of you was like, Tara, you don't have to do this. It's the piece of you that wants life. It's the piece of you that is life itself, you know, that I, we all have. And the way I talk about it in glow in the fucking dark is you know, scientifically, we are made of stars, like not a cute fable, not a nice thing. I'm saying the elements, phosphorus, magnesium, those things came from stars and are what make us up. And so if you can think of, if you know, what's your first thing when you think of stars, you know, beautiful, radiant, pure, light, you don't think bad. And if you can remember that, then that's that to me, that's the little inner spark in all of us is that I am born of stardust. You are born of stardust. And what a big deal that we were both born of the same thing. (laughs) You know, that's what always brings me back to connectedness because it's not theoretical. It's not like a, a religious thing to say that that's just science. And so that's what I think that voice within all of us is, is that weird, cool, animating force of stardust saying, I want to shine. I want to live. That's so beautiful. I love when we can wrap an idea that can feel like esoteric or woo woo. And we just like wrap it up in science. And it's just like, end of conversation. You are stardust. I am stardust. Like that's the place from which the whole thing begins. So yeah, exactly. (laughs) Exactly. Mm And it is trauma. It is painful dynamics in your family of origin. It is cultural conditioning that takes us away from that inner knowing. And throughout the book, you provide tools and practices that have served you. Sometimes, even like despite yourself. So when you write about meditation, which you hated in the beginning, you write, of course, I want to let go. But how, for the love of God, How about I let go of my fist into your stupid, tranquil face? Like that was your foray into meditation. You were not a reluctant customer, hey? Oh, I was hateful (laughs) because I'd read these like self-help books that are like, find peace and joy. Let your mind go blank. And I'm like, um... (laughs) I feel the opposite of a blank mind when I'm meditating. I feel like I'm going in 55 directions with no control, no breaks. Um, And then I feel even worse because I feel bad about myself because I'm a bad meditator. You know, so I really was uh, very reluctant. Um, And I also hated the language. It felt so big, like find your seat. Like, what? okay, what is that? Are we talking about butts? Is it a butt? Yeah, it... <laughs> it's just your butt. Like, mm-hmm. okay, sit on your butt. Cool, thank you. Could you have just said, sit down and feel your butt? That would have been way more helpful to me. And so, you know, I went on a meditation journey extremely reluctantly. Um, I went on a silent meditation retreat. I went from like zero to 50, I was like, I've never successfully meditated for 10 minutes. Let me try five days of silence, which was a terrible way. You know, like I was, again, I was like muscling my way through life. I thought, oh, I'll get an A if I can do this. Who this A was coming from, I don't know. And my biggest lesson in that whole thing is I kind of went nuts. Like I was so anxious. I was so depressed. I was so like wrapped up in my mind that at the end, you know, I wasn't sleeping. I wasn't really eating. I was like in some weird panic attack um, where I felt like maybe I had even heard the voice of God. Like it was a mess. And so I had a meeting with the meditation teacher and I was like, oh my God, and I heard a voice and like this and my life is a mess. And he was like, okay, pause. We can talk about 
all these issues later, but you seem really flooded. Can we just work on that? And I was like, oh, yeah, well, we can. And we did some grounding exercises like, can you feel your feet on the floor? Oh, yeah, I can. And that feels good. Can you notice one pleasant thing? Like you're spinning, but is there one pleasant thing you can hang on to? Oh, yeah, this beautiful tree that's outside my window that I had never noticed before. And what I came to find out is that meditation for me is a way that I've learned to regulate my own emotions, to see that I'm not any one emotion at one time, so that even when I'm really depressed, there are parts of me that can notice pleasant things. There are parts of me that can still enjoy company with my sister, that it's never just, if, if you're able to see that you can house a lot of different emotions, it's way harder to get overwhelmed by one. And as I've been practicing the past three years, been on a ton more meditation retreats since then, what I've noticed is that everybody's mind wanders. For your mind to be blank, you have to be dead. So like, that's not what we're going for here. It's mindfulness. It's just seeing what is happening. And with time, you can kind of quiet things. But I, I'm really angry, actually, at meditation teachers who say things like, let your mind go blank, release all your thoughts, because I think it inhibits a lot of people from trusting in meditation or even trying meditation. Right. It's oftentimes presented as a place you go, like a, like a sort of drifting out of self. And what you're saying is actually for you, meditation has been an embodiment. It's been a coming into yourself and having more nuance of what's happening inside of you rather than deleting or escaping from what's happening inside of you. It's sitting with yourself and being okay. And, you know, there's a term spiritual bypass, which is when meditators they're not actually like communing with the like ethereal spirit of the world. They're just escaping. <laughs> like they're just distracting themselves, escaping um, and not dealing with what is real, which basically the bottom line of meditation is, can you deal with reality? That's basically all it is. Like, can you be present and like be in this place now? Um, so yeah, I really hope that people give it a, more of a try. I agree. I do think we're in like this exciting new like generation of meditation. I think there's just a lot more like nuance and lots of different approaches and voices that you will connect with. Like you don't have to love every meditation teacher. You just need to have a few go-tos or a few processes because what you're talking about, right. You're talking about just creating more capacity inside of yourself to notice and hold the different facets of your emotional experience. You aren't all this or all that. And so to make more space inside of yourself for those complexities. Yeah, probably one of the most important things I hope people take away from this book is the project of building a safe home within yourself benefits you in every single moment of your life. And so all these tools are basically how do we build internal safety? And it's not a miracle. You know, internal safety isn't like something that will be shot down from heaven and into your body. It's something you build piece by piece. These are the tools that I use that help me and I hope they help others. There's a really um, beautiful part of the book where you tell the story of having been nominated for an Emmy and it goes sideways. And it was a big learning for you. And you wrote that instead of focusing on validation and outcomes, I've started paying attention to the thing that I really have loved all along, the processes. So talk to us about how, what's, how have you begun to shift from those, even like the thing, like you were saying before about the, the hiking app, you know, completing the thing on the hiking app, which is so, I mean, I get that, like that lands really deeply for like, give me any external thing. Like I'm there, I'm on it. So what, but that has become your practice is like from everything, like the little, you know, ding on your hiking app, all the way to this almost Emmy, you have really been practicing moving from external validation and outcomes to noticing the process. Tell us more. Yeah. So I'll back up and tell a teeny bit of the story. So I hate Emmy season. I worked in Hollywood for like 12 years. I had to deal with the Emmys for like five of those years. I fucking hate them. 
um, until, of course, I was nominated for an Emmy. <laughs> and then <laughs> I was like, yeah, I love the Emmys. Like, Woohoo. Like, I'm so excited. <laughs> like, completely different person right. um, about it. And I was so proud, mostly because the thing I was nominated for was something I had worked really hard on and had earned the respect of the people on the nomination with me. And that really was what mattered. But, you know, I was getting texts from people I hadn't heard from in forever and people are high-fiving me and my dad's so proud of me. And I was like, hell yeah. Okay, the world is seeing me as Emmy nominated and forever I'll be Tara Schuster Emmy nominated. Like I can always put that next to my name. And this all came crashing down to earth when my boss's boss's boss called me and told me that he didn't think it was appropriate for me to be on the Emmy nomination, even though I had done the work for the nomination um, due to like a technical title change. Didn't change all the work I'd done. I just had a new job. Yeah. Um, it was not a pleasant moment, you know, and he said, it's not a good look. You need to decide what you're going to do, which meant you have to Emmy unnominate yourself. I was afraid if I didn't, that I would forever be besmirched because this is a huge Hollywood person, also a pretty good, like a good person and a good mentor. And I wanted to be in his good graces. So it was never a question. Like I worried if I'd get another job again, because it was like that big of a deal to him that I thought references, you know, he, he is going to hold this against me. So I Emmy nominated myself. You know, I obviously had all the worries of what are people going to think of me when they hear the Emmy nomination and I'm not on it. What are, are people going to think I was a liar? Are they going to think I, something was found wrong with me? And it was at that exact moment that I decided external validation. It just has never worked once for me. Like the empirical data is when someone congratulates me on something or I get the promotion or the Emmy nomination, it's like a fleeting moment of yes. And then it's like gone through the window and I can never hang on to it. And since it's never worked, not one time, maybe it's time to let go of that. And that's where process comes in because what I am really proud of and what nobody can ever take away from me, you cannot unnominate me from how much I loved working on that web series. You can't, you cannot take away from me the hours of bliss in the edit room, the joy I felt when I made a decision that the comedians respected. That's, that stuff is mine now and forever. And so now that's what I look at, you know, with the book, for example, what no one can ever take from me is that I put my soul on the page. That is always a success now and forever. And it's hard, right? Because we're told the journey is the destination and we're all like, oh, yeah, right. Like I roll, please. How many of us believe it? And it's true. And that's why people say it. And it's, I, I think it's a lot about getting real about what actually feels good for you. Is it really external validation? Did you, were you able to hang on to that? Like for real? And I would be shocked if most people said, yes, external validation, really, when I look at it, is the thing that makes me happy. And I would ask, well, what does? You know, obviously that thing matters to you. So what on the journey to that thing can you claim as your own, can give you a little joy? And, you know, unfortunately, the cliche is right. The journey, <laughs> the process, the habits you built towards getting somewhere those are the gold. I wish it were otherwise, you know, because then this would be a lot easier. It would be. Right? We, we wouldn't have to yeah. do any work. No, you would just figure out the goal and you would get the goal and then you could exhale. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, then you'd yeah, be yeah. like, yeah, my life is awesome. Mm -hmm. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. Like, <laughs> yeah. There are, I mean, very, very, very few people have ever experienced what, what 
you experience the way in which you learn that lesson, but that lesson is essential. Like I am taking it and I'm chewing on it and figuring out kind of where that goes in my life. So it's such like, even just that is such a generous offering. So thank you so much for, for sharing that with us and for this idea that like, right, you really tried, you tried very, very hard to have external validation be the thing. And I am so glad that you liberated yourself from that and that you are now inviting and challenging us to liberate ourselves from it as well. And once you get good at it, which, which is to say just aware it gets easier and easier and easier because sometimes I find myself wanting to write an email to my editor saying, is this good? Do people like it? What are you hearing internally? And whenever I hear that, I'm like, who is speaking right now? Because it, I can also feel this tinny vibration of like, I need, I need, I need, I need you to tell me I'm good. And if I can just pause, oh, right. She can't tell me I'm good because it won't matter. It just won't matter. Whatever her answer is never going to make me feel good. Then I can come back to myself. So with practice, it gets even, it does get a lot easier. Beautiful. There's a part where, so you mentioned in the beginning that you are beginning to date, but there was a while where you weren't dating and you was, you struggled with this idea that like it was, you felt like it was taking you too long to find a mate and your friends were getting married. And I love what one of your friends offered to you. You have invested so much time into healing, growing, adventuring. Don't you think it's possible that your person has been doing the same, that you both have been very busy? Was that a weight off your shoulders? Like, what was that like? I'm so glad you brought that up because it was one of the top moments of yes that I've had in my life where it was like lightning bolt. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, oh, the problem isn't just me. And the problem isn't that there's something defective with me that makes it so all of my friends are like, literally all of my friends are married. I think I have like one unmarried friend or divorced friends, but they'd have all been married at least once. And sometimes I get really self-conscious about that. And I've been on such a completely different journey. I had to do so much work to undo much less build who I am. And my interests are so not what my friends are, you know, and I'm not on a linear path of any kind. So it was really freeing to think like, oh yeah, well, obviously the person I'm going to be with has also been on some kind of journey like this. And so when we link up, like, holy shit, that's going to be <laughs> fire, explosive, you know, like stars, stars, I'm wait, I'm I'm looking for my in the book I say I'm looking for my blue star because one of my favorite constellations El Berio is a turning yellow diamond like star with a sapphire blue star and the contrast between the two and the shine those two stars give each other that's what I want I want that the contrast and that complement and I want to be the diamond star because obviously, obviously I am the diamond star. They're the blue star. Oh, it's just so liberal. You know, I think especially around date, like the vulnerability around dating and when you're partnered and who's partnered and who's not partnered, it's so oppressive. So there is just so much liberation in your friend offering that to you and you just letting it because you had to do your part of letting it in and being like, oh yes, that's what's happening. Yeah. And, you know, all this work that I've been doing, yeah. it all builds. So stuff gets easier simply because you've already done all this other work. So something like that, where I may have in the past rolled my eyes and been like, Ugh, you're just trying to make me feel good. I actually could take in because I'm, I know I'm a worthy person. I know I'm good. Oh, that makes more sense uh -huh. than... Oh, I'm a hopeless piece of shit. <laughs> That's right. That's right. That makes That's more right. sense. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Oh. All right. Before I let you go, I want to just talk about what I think was my favorite chapter of the book, which is one towards the very end called Grief and Gratitude. It's just, I mean, I read the whole chapter with tears in my eyes. And um, and you come back to you give us a bit of a sense of where you are in your relationship today with both your mother and your father and what those journeys have been like. And so I feel a bit protective of the reader. Like I want them to kind of have the whole context, you know, before they get to that piece. But I wonder, 
there's just so much in there about um, boundaries and risk taking and possibilities that you never could have anticipated about how relationships can unfold. And um, but I guess I want I would just wonder what might you want to share about where you are in your relationship today with your mother and your father, or what you'd want us to kind of hold on to about where your journey with them has been and, and is. Well, I first off just want to thank you for sharing your reaction to that chapter, because as I told you, you're the very first person I'm talking to about this new book. And so it just really means something to me that that landed for you. So thank you. I had an obviously very difficult relationship with both my parents, my mom, so psychologically abusive, also physical, like degrading examinations of my body that started when I was really young and that physically I could not be around her without wanting to jump away. You know, that it was my instinct was always to flee. And for a long time, I kind of questioned that like, oh, did I like build a false memory in my mind? And the answer, the very simple answer is no, because I would not have the instinct to flee if everything had been okay. And I, I would love people to hang on to that, that like, if you have a terrible feeling about someone or something and you're like, am I overreacting or did I really remember it right? Your body did. Like you wouldn't, you just wouldn't feel this way if it had been normal. And so, you know, I had to, I haven't spoken to her in like 15 years um, because I needed to draw a really um, strong boundary because she was hurting me to the extent that I couldn't live a free life. And so it was a difficult decision. I for sure did not want to make it, but strong boundary. I don't talk to, see, or receive emails, no contact with my mom. My dad, on the other hand, had been my only parent and, you know, he was my adult and it was a very flawed relationship. Um, in Lily's, I talk a lot about how he was addicted to weed. He had a substance abuse issue, which, you know, I like begged him, you know, can you just not be high at home? Like, cause it, I felt devalued. Like you can't be sober to talk to me. And now I know oh, it had nothing to do with me, right? And all the messaging I got from him was, you're not valuable. And so in the very end of Lily's, he had um, some very traumatic brain surgeries that I was the one who like figured out, oh my God, he's really ill. And I rushed him to the hospital, took care of his health, you know, got the home health aid, did the whole thing. And that's the end of Lily's. And it's like, yay, my relationship with my dad is healing. And then not at all, because he wasn't grateful at all for the help I had given him. He continued to provoke me as if I were his child. And like, I was responsible for his emotional life and he wanted reactions out of me. And so at the very beginning of COVID, I was just like, enough you, I cannot heal with you being this presence, this like bleeding presence that always needs my attention. And so I stopped talking to him. And so there were two years where I was not talking to half of my immediate family. And after my dad got COVID, which like two years later, he got COVID and I rushed to like help him, you know, when you're, when I, when they're sick, it's like, whatever I'm here. And what I found out was that because I had stopped talking to him, it had put him in such an emotionally, you know, raw and desperate place that he started going to therapy and he had been in therapy for every week of the two preceding years. And he was such a different person. I call him dad too. <laughs> you know, like, and if, when, if I'll text him, I'll be like, thanks, dad, too. You know, he was generous. He was grateful. He asked me questions about me and actually seemed to care. And I think we get really scared that if we create boundaries, people are, their, their feelings are going to be hurt and, and they're not going to like us. When in reality, unless you build a boundary, why would anyone change? there's just no incentive. And, and we think, 
oh, like we don't want to hurt his feelings. Yeah, it did suck. I'm sure it sucked for him a lot that he didn't have any contact with me. And he would tell you today, he would have never grown had I not done that. And so when we don't build a boundary, when we chicken out, both for their sake and ours, we think for their sake and ours, we deny ourselves an opportunity to grow. We deny them an opportunity to grow. And nothing gets better. So that's what I've, you know, and even with my mom, by drawing that boundary and and giving myself, I needed 15 years to build enough compassion to be able to see her as someone who is greatly suffering, you know, I, to realize that to hurt me the way she did, what happened to her and how painful each of those instances must have been for her soul. And so I now forgive her and I'm in therapy working on, maybe I will open that door to her once more. Forgiveness, true love, real relationship, feeling protected by my dad for the first time ever. All of those things came from boundaries and honesty. Yeah. And I I wish it hadn't been that you had to close the door to your dad completely in order for him to listen. Like that is, that is a, a message I want every, you know, everybody who's raising everyone who's in a parental role, right? Like don't ever, ever, ever let it get to that point where you are that checked out from your kid that they have to go to that, you know, they have to close the door completely before you listen. But that is all too often what happens. And it's not a guarantee, right? Like your the story of you and your dad, there was no, and you didn't do it. You didn't do it in order for your dad to be motivated to go into therapy. So you, you know, it was, that was the consequence. That was what happened, but you did not know, you didn't know that was going to happen and you didn't do it in order for that to happen because it's something you can't control anyways. And that's really important for everybody to hear is I know this isn't the typical case that you draw a boundary and somebody changes. And I'd like to say how many of us are actually building boundaries to test that hypothesis. (laughs) Like, because we say they'll never change. Yet, how many of us are giving anybody incentive to change? How many of us are putting a line in the ground? So it's both. I I think there's a lot more hope than we think, and it's no guarantee. And you can't go into it with the expectation. You basically have to go in with no expectation and just, I'm giving us both this opportunity by drawing this boundary, come what may. Yes, right. I hate that you went through what you went through, like your family, your early childhood, like what little Tara had to survive. I wish no I wish you hadn't had to survive it. I wish nobody would have to survive it. And I'm glad that you survived it and I'm glad that you share her story, little Tara's story. You are honoring her in that way, like what you survived in that way. And I'm glad for your dad for his own healing and for his healing in his relationship with his daughter that he is doing his work and he's, you know, an older guy, like it shows that it's not ever too late. That's that's pretty cool. He's 78. And that's part of the grief here is I, you know, I wish my dad had um, done any of this much sooner. And if I'm, if I only get six months of a supportive dad, hallelujah, amen. That six months I never thought I'd have. And so I'm deeply, deeply grateful. And I really appreciate you saying about my childhood. I don't want to have had the childhood I had. I much would have preferred to have a stable household where I felt like I mattered. I would choose that every day over writing books about it, you know? And that's what happened to me. And the, and this was the only way I could make meaning of it and hopefully make it something helpful for others, making it into some kind of a gift. Yes. Uh-huh. You know, uh-huh. and, and not just a, a total curse uh, and looking at it a different way. It's the ultimate both and, right? To say that I, I would have preferred to not have had to live that and I will use that in all of the ways that I'm using it and I will offer it and I will work with it. It is the ultimate both and. Like it's such a powerful paradox that you that you sit in. So thank you. Thank you for sitting in it. Yeah, thank you. It's, it is the only way towards freedom. That's what I realized at the end of the day, why am I doing all this? For my own freedom 
so that I'm not ruled by these things that happened to me or were done to me. And so I'm not living in my head in agony. You know, it's, I want freedom to be myself. And though this work can seem overwhelming, you know, like, oh, it's going to be so hard on the other side, which by the way, is an other side I'll be working on forever. But I've done enough work to see, oh, wait, this is a way easier way to live. Like all my decisions are easier. How I move in the world, completely easier. I barely am anxious, which is like a wild uh, state of affairs right now. This is an easier way to live. Healing, way easier, takes way less time than you think. You're just, you have to do the work. Time does not heal all wounds. It just gives them wrinkles. You got to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I have really enjoyed this time with you. So thank you so much for taking the time to be here with me. Thank you. The feeling is so mutual. Thank you. So where else do you want people to go to learn more about you? Yeah, the number one place to learn about me is, um, and just to can be on this journey with me, is my newsletter, which comes out every Friday where I give, you know, not hacky, not cheesy, throw up in your mouth, self-care tips and things I'm thinking about. And you can subscribe by going to tarashuster.com slash newsletter or by texting GLOW, G-L-O-W to 66866, if that's easier for folks. And then I'm mostly on the gram talking about this same stuff, trying to make one non-toxic corner. I'm like, this is my corner, damn it. And it's not going to be toxic. It's not going to be like forced positivity and no meanness. Good. <laughs> <laughs> so come, come join me on this experiment. <laughs> Thank you, Tara, for being here with me today. The humor and the candor that Tara brings to these serious topics is so refreshing and permission-giving, and I hope that you found a piece of her story that you could connect to and learn from. I urge you to check out Tara's new book, Glow in the Effing Dark, as soon as you can. It's linked in the show notes. Until next time, be well. Do you have a relationship question that you want answered on the show? Visit reimagininglove.com to send in a written or audio question. Questions can be about intimate partnerships, family relationships, friendships, you name it. If you're looking for more love and relationship content, you can find me on Instagram at dr.alexandra.solomon or visit my website, dralexandrasolomon.com, where you'll find my blog as well as the Intimate Relationships 101 e-course based off of the popular class I teach at Northwestern University. Thank you for listening and see you next week here on Reimagining Love.